Caroline, thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Uh, I'm, I, I'm really glad to have you here. You know, Caroline and, and I have known each other for the last dozen years, and we had, I think it was, was it three years at RSA, we just had this sold out metrics panel. We did, it was cool. You know, I'll never forget the line down the hall in Moscone Center of folks waiting to get in. And I'll never forget when they asked us to do an encore session and we decided to do that one with whiskey at like 4.30 in the afternoon. I mean, it was just so much fun. Well, you're, you're welcome to have whiskey today. Um, but uh, I, again, I'm, I'm really happy to have you here and I hope things are going well for you at your new company. So um, I will let you just take this away. Fantastic. Thank you so much, John. Um, I appreciate so much uh, being asked to join today. Uh, and I think it's so amazing that you're able to bring these, this group of folks together. Um, so I'm here to talk about our mission as cybersecurity professionals and the culture of the environments that we find ourselves in. In my roles over the past several years, I've had the pleasure of hosting roundtable discussions with cybersecurity leaders around the globe. And the most common challenge that I hear about has to do with hiring and, re and retaining great talent. So a couple of years ago, I found myself in a very unusual situation. My boss, Jacob Hansen, asked me if I would like to lead the people function at COBOL. So the thing is, I've worked as a cybersecurity practitioner for 15 years. I'm very passionate about people. That's why I created the Humans of InfoSec podcast, but I've never actually worked in human resources before. So Jacob said to me, look, we're really onto something here. The company has found product market fit and our impact on the industry continues to grow. Now, the most important thing for us to do is to focus on our people. In the next few years, we will elevate Cobalt's people function to be a world-class organization. And to do this, we must build an environment that cultivates personal and professional performance, growth, and happiness. In order for Cobalt to be successful in the near and long term, we must attract, acquire, and retain great talent. So today, I have the unusual job where I lead both people and security at Cobalt. When I joined the company three years ago, four years ago now, I was the eighth employee. Today we're about 120 members strong uh, and we hope to grow the team to 150 by the end of this year. It has been super fun and I'm very excited to see where this journey takes us next. So that's a little bit about why people matter at Cobalt. Today I'm gonna talk about why do people matter for cybersecurity. I wanna share with you some musings that I have on what humans can do to solve cybersecurity problems and what machines can do to help us out with that. I want to talk about an outcome of the skills shortage and frankly, everything we've been experiencing this year and burnout and the impact that has on us as professionals and the work that we do. I want to share a couple examples of cognitive behavioral therapy that I found personally uh, to be very helpful. And I do have some action-oriented takeaways, both for hiring managers as well as for everyone. So let's go ahead and dive in. I wanna start with why does cybersecurity matter in the first place? And it's because the internet was never intended to do what it does today. In 1969, four university computers at UCLA, Stanford, USB, UCSB, and the University of Utah were connected via ARPANET, a project started by the Defense Department's Advanced Research Projects Agency. In 1985, the National Science Foundation established NSFNet, a network of scientific computers that serve scientists, researchers, and engineers who worked for the National Center for Atmospheric Research. These people studied the atmosphere and its interactions with the oceans, land, and sun. A decade later, the internet was being used to support electronic commerce. During a 1998 US Senate testimonial, a group of security researchers explained that the internet was not quote unquote designed for it. 
They described the academic and scientific objectives of getting computers to talk to each other. From that testimonial, quote, it grew up, it flourished, it struck everybody by surprise, and now big business is saying, well, let's jump on board and make some money off of this. Well, this is kind of like if you've driven in Boston. The streets aren't tremendously designed in a wonderful fashion because they follow the cows around and they laid the pavement down. I mean, you can get it to work, but it can be really painful. In 2003, the first version of the OWASP top 10 was published. And in 2011, Mark Andreessen wrote, software is eating the world. So here we are. Cybersecurity is a problem because we use the internet for things that it was never designed to accommodate. And so many things depend on software. When value shifts from the physical world to the digital world, protecting that value has to shift too. Today, we have tremendous demand for cybersecurity talent and simply not enough supply. The latest ISC squared cybersecurity workforce study states that the workforce gap has increased, again, primarily due to the global surge in hiring demand. Using the global workforce estimate of 2.8 million, based on the 11 economies for which ISC squared provided a workforce estimate, and the global gap estimate of, four, of over 4 million, they estimate that the global workforce needs to grow by 145%. In this particular 2019 study, 65% of organizations represented have a shortage of staff dedicated to cybersecurity, and the lack of skilled and experienced cybersecurity personnel is a top concern among survey respondents. So it's really no surprise to me that, that when I get together with folks who are cybersecurity leaders and hiring managers, that the number one problem that folks tell me about is hiring. So the thing is that just like any other business initiative, a successful cybersecurity program needs the right balance of people, process, and technology. Tools can be useful, but no tool is a silver bullet. Any type of cybersecurity technology still requires people and the right workflows to be effective. I wanna talk for just a moment about why unfortunately all of our cybersecurity problems can't simply be solved by using technology. The thing is that computers are really good at doing exactly what you tell them to do. They are not so good at thinking creatively or applying business logic. Even the most sophisticated machine learning techniques are still vulnerable to what's called concept drift. The idea that machine learning predictions are made by using old pattern matching are made by using pattern matching on old data. The old data never exactly matches the new data, so the predictions can never be exactly right. To me, this is sort of obvious. If someone built a machine that could accurately predict the future, that would be awesome. To my knowledge, unfortunately, this does not exist yet. I want to share an analogy that has to, doing, that has to do with using a machine to correct spelling errors. Let's talk about a spell checker. Spell checker is extremely useful, but it's not perfect. Look over there at the drawing on the whiteboard. Their ideas are articulated nicely. They're going to take a picture and share it with the rest of the team. A computer program sees nothing wrong with the spelling of these words, but a human does. Similarly, when it comes to something like finding security vulnerabilities in software, computers can't find everything. Only humans can find business logic flaws. And these are often some of the most interesting and most severe security vulnerabilities that there are. In his 2011 OWASP presentation called How to Protect, How to Prevent, rather, Business Flaws, Vulnerabilities in Web Applications, Marco Morana highlights password reset flaws username recovery flaws, and the following e-commerce business logic attacks, altering the price of an item before checkout and bypassing payment validation before shipping an item. It would be super convenient if you could just buy a piece of technology that would do everything for you. 
Unfortunately, cybersecurity scanners and firewalls can't solve everything. Their effectiveness is directly re related to the skills and the manual effort of the people who must tune them to a specific environment, monitor them regularly, and filter the signal from the noise. I have been so fascinated by this idea of human versus machine that my colleague Vanessa Sauter and I decided to look further into it. We recently developed and published a report called the State of Pentesting 2020. Vanessa and I worked together at Cobalt.io, and during the last four years, our pen test as a service company has conducted more than 2,500 pen tests through our PTAS platform. The report features insights from aggregated data derived from nearly 1,200 pen tests conducted in 2019. We also analyzed survey responses from more than 100 practitioners in security, development, operations, and product roles regarding their application security programs. Finally, the report includes insights from members of our closed Cobalt Core pen tester community in partnership with independent researchers, engineers, and some other security practitioners. I think that one of the most exciting topics that this report assesses is which web application security vulnerabilities can be found using machines and which require human expertise to manually identify. The scope of this particular exploration is black box pen testing, humans, against dynamic scanning and out of band testing, machines, for web applications. We investigate these questions and here are some of the key findings. Humans win at finding the following vulnerability types, business logic bypasses, race conditions, and chained exploits. And although machines broadly win at finding most vulnerability types when applied correctly, scanning results should be used as guideposts and analyzed contextually. There are also vulnerabilities that neither humans nor machines can independently find. Rather, they must work together to identify these types of issues. Some of the types in this category include things like authorization flaws, out-of-band XML external entity, SAML XXE injection, DOM-based cross-site scripting, insecure deserialization, remote code exploitation, session management, file upload bugs, and subdomain takeovers. I invite everyone to check out the report. It's totally free to download. It's, it's an extensive report. It's like, it's like more than 25 pages long. Okay, so back to our initial subject, which is cybersecurity talent, mission, and culture. So the internet was not built with security in mind. The world has a massive talent shortage and we can't rely on automation to solve everything. What is happening to the people in this scenario? If you're on a cybersecurity team, I'm willing to bet that you have more to do than time and resources to do it. Maybe one of your colleagues left for a new job last month and there are two additional unfilled positions on your team. You could actually be in a position where you're trying to do the jobs of four people. An ISSA study found that 70% of cybersecurity professionals feel impacted by the talent shortage, resulting in an increased workload and a situation where teams spend more of their time fighting fires than focusing on training, planning, and strategy. It is also the perfect setup for burnout. Burnout is described as a state of chronic stress that leads to physical and emotional exhaustion, cynicism and detachment, and feelings of ineffectiveness and lack of accomplishment. Severe burnout means you can no longer function effectively on a personal or professional level. The tricky thing is that burnout doesn't happen overnight. It sort of creeps in gradually in this sneaky way that fools us into thinking that living in a state of constant stress is normal and acceptable. Living in a state of constant stress should not be normal and it is not acceptable. Today, it is October 2nd in the year 2020 and it has been a particularly weird year. In February, I booked a flight scheduled to depart in July to Berlin. In January, we had gotten our whole company together for our Q1, Q2 kickoff, 
in San Francisco, and I was so looking forward to doing the same this summer. In March, we decided to require all Cobalt employees to work from home. I have two young kids. My husband and I are used to being in school. And since that time, we've been adjusting to being around each other 24 by seven. This gorgeous background behind me, which you can tell because actually the skin tone of my shoulder is a little bit too close to the skin tone of the floor in this virtual background. What I'm hiding is my super messy actual bedroom in the other corner of which has my kindergarten daughter's remote learning setup. So we're just, we're all adjusting. On June 8th, we announced we're going remote first at Cobalt. And of course, sadly, I had to cancel my summer trip to Berlin. Uh, in July, we ended up doing our Q3, Q4 company kickoff virtually using Zoom and breakout rooms. I really miss seeing our team in person and I am disappointed that we were not able to share meals and hugs like we normally would. Over the past few months, when I've talked with fellow cybersecurity practitioners around the globe, I've learned that many of their strategies, priorities, and workflows have been turned upside down. We are facing unforeseen challenges that come with facing the unprecedented times that we're in. Luckily, security professionals are more adept in combating the unpredictable than most. The thing is that we've always had to figure out how to overcome adversity and adapt to change. No one, not even the most data-driven, experienced professionals among us, can accurately predict the future. No one has the ability to put together a perfect plan. What we can do, and what I'm thrilled that we're doing, is we can come together and collaborate. We can share our lessons learned, our success stories, and real examples of how each of us have pivoted to overcome various obstacles and solve different problems. Yesterday, I was talking with Marcin, the CEO at Malwarebytes, during a Malware Knots fireside chat. Um, and we were talking and Marcin says to me, Caroline, what from your perspective has been the impact of COVID on cybersecurity? And I said, well, we're all super stressed out we're all trying to do a lot of things at once. And what that means is that we and all the employees at the companies that we work for, when we're stressed out and anxious, we're a little more likely to fall for social engineering. We're a little more likely to make human errors. This picture is not Marcin. This picture is my good friend, Richard. Uh, Richard has a great talk that he did at DEF CON a few years ago during which he talks about our industry's burnout problem. Because of the massive talent shortage, because of all the other things that are going on in the world right now, it is so absolutely critical that the professionals in our industry take care of themselves because the world needs us. What we're capable of bringing to the table as healthy, happy, functioning professionals is simply too valuable to lose. I want to talk with you about some of the challenges that I faced and maybe some piece of it will resonate with you. And if that's the case, maybe we can each feel a little more con connected and a little less alone. I want to talk to you about a concept called cognitive behavioral therapy. The basic idea is that our thoughts, emotions, and behaviors are all connected and that you have the power to change or at least influence one by changing the other. So to do it, you identify a negative thought process and then you try to change it into a positive one. This can be easier said than done because our negative thought processes are often so deep seated in our brains that we don't even realize that they're there. I'm gonna talk through an example. My parents are immigrants and they raised me to be able to take care of myself and to have as many choices in life as possible. When I was a kid growing up, doing well in school was a really big deal in my household. As a child and a teenager, I did well in school and that felt good. But when I started the electrical engineering and computer science program at UC Berkeley, all of a sudden, that part of my identity changed. It took me decades to develop the core belief that I am smart and that I work hard. 
Unfortunately, over time, I also began to develop a few associated core beliefs that are quite negative and self-defeating. Number one, my worth comes from my success in school and work. Number two, if I am not constantly exceeding expectations, then I am a failure. Number three, I need to work harder, and unless I am succeeding, I don't deserve to be treated well. Over the past decade or so, I've worked hard to try and replace these negative belief processes in my brain with positive ones. Oops. I accept myself as I am right now. I know and I approve of myself. I embrace balance. I encourage myself to play and enjoy life. At this point in the talk, we've got about 20 minutes left. It's time to shift gears and talk about key takeaways for hiring managers. I'm going to share some of the strategies that we use at Cobalt to attract, retain, and grow awesome talent. First, you wanna attract great people. And I'll tell you what, when it comes to cybersecurity, Pretty much everyone with strong skills and experience already has a job. They're not super likely to go to your company's job posting site and submit their resume. That's not to say that inbound candidates aren't valuable, but you cannot rely on them alone to fill your positions. As a hiring manager, you've got to be proactive and opportunistic when it comes to recruiting. You need to go and find the people that you want to hire. Know that you will need to do a lot of outreach. If you have a great recruiter, this person can help, but I think the best person to do outreach is the hiring manager. I know this takes time and time is a precious and a finite resource. It is simply a matter of prioritization. If you want to attract great people to your team, you must make hiring a priority. If you find someone amazing and they don't happen to exactly match your original job description, consider updating the JD or changing your hiring strategy. Once you've made an offer to a candidate and they've accepted, your next priority should be to keep them, assuming they perform. Some employee retention programs have perks like free snacks and paid gym membership, but I've come to realize that what really matters to people is something different. In 2012, Google conducted a study to try and figure out how to build the perfect team they examined everything from how frequently people eat together to common traits between the best managers. They analyzed 180 teams throughout the company, and they also reviewed half a century's work worth of academic studies on how teams work. Surprisingly, the data didn't seem to show that a mix of specific personality types, skills, or backgrounds made any significant difference. It turns out that what does matter is something called psychological safety, a sense of confidence that the team will not embarrass, reject, or punish someone for speaking up. Teams are always gonna have their issues, regardless of whether people talk about them or not. Team members that trust each other are more likely to share information so that issues can come to the surface and be managed efficiently and proactively. Another thing that I think it's absolutely critical for hiring managers to do is to grow their people. I think this matters even more when it comes to the cybersecurity field. It's important for every business function to have well-defined levels so that team members understand what is expected of them to get to the next level. Performance reviews don't need to be onerous, but they should be structured so that team members can have productive conversations with their managers about where they are today and where they're heading tomorrow. High-performing individuals should be acknowledged and promoted. When I began my new role as head of people at Cobalt, I asked our people operations manager for a book recommendation. She told me about this book called Sapiens. One of the concepts that this book talks about is how humans can create and maintain culture through one-on-one -on -one relationships. And this works until a group reaches about 100 people. At that point, something more is needed to support and enforce cultural values. When Cobalt was growing from eight to 50 people, it was easy enough to involve pretty much everyone in the hiring process. 
And in this way, we made sure that new hires brought onto the team were adding to the culture in a positive way that was aligned with our core values. As we prepared for growth from 50 to 100 to 120, and now we're headed toward 150, we knew it was time to write down our values in order to scale the people decisions on who to hire, who to promote, and who to transition out of the company. Our CEO conducted an exercise where he asked us all to stand in a circle. And one by one, he would ask individuals to come into the middle of the circle and he would talk about the observable values that these people represented. So for example, he asked Robert Kugler to come into the middle of, this, of the circle. And he said, you know, I love working with Robert. He's got amazing enthusiasm. He's always optimistic. He is not afraid to get his hands dirty. He's collaborative. And he's always thinking about how to make things faster and better and how to use automation. And then he asked, you know, my colleague Marion to come and join him in the circle. He said, you know, Marion is structured. She's systematic. She's humble and she's always looking to learn and get better. She's hardworking, she's motivated, and she gets shit done. So what we did was Jacob called one by one about a dozen of our team members into the middle of the circle, and he talked about the way in which each of these individuals exemplifies the values that we want to have on our team. We put it all in a spreadsheet. We invited everyone in the company to you know, jointly collaborate and tell us what they thought. Uh, and we came up with the following. And I'll read kind of the short version because I would like actually to have some time at the end uh, if there are any questions. So we have four values now. One of them is humble learning. So at Cobalt, we're humble learners. What we did yesterday may not work tomorrow. We approach problem solving with a creative growth mindset. We know that sometimes failure is part of a natural learning process. We humbly seek to learn from subject matter experts. We believe everyone has something to contribute. The next is lead with grit. We know that achievement comes from a strong work ethic and relentless execution. We do not quit when the going gets tough. We produce quality at speed. This is an interesting one, right? <laughs> because some folks, I think, have a belief that you can either have quality or you can have speed. We actually believe that you can do both, and the way to do that is via prioritization. We say no to what is not important. We focus on the things that are important, and we get those done with quality at speed. And finally, we are one cobalt. We believe that when we collaborate, we can make two plus two equal 10. We respect our colleagues, and we value each person's unique contribution. So those are some of my takeaways for hiring managers. I also have takeaways for all of us. So I want to tell you something that I realized a couple of years ago, and that is for those of us that have and are developing our skills in cybersecurity, there is a really beautiful silver lining to the talent gap, which is that we have choices. Four years ago in 2016, my daughter was one year old. And it became apparent to me that my lifestyle as a traveling management consultant needed to change. I began to search for a local job, and I spoke with 15 different organizations about various cybersecurity roles. That was an extremely fortunate position to be in. During my job search in 2016, the number one criteria I looked for was people that I like and respect who like and respect me. It turns out, that being surrounded by people that I trust makes my life a lot better. My number two criteria was the ability to have a big impact. And that's why for the first time in my career, I joined a startup and it has been awesome. So my advice for everyone, because right now, you know, those of us with kids, we, first of all, we're extraordinarily fortunate to be in an industry where we can do our jobs working remotely. And some of us have kids at home and some of us haven't been able to hug our friends in six months. And, you know, I'm, I'm used to getting on a plane every month and going and traveling and seeing friends and colleagues. And, and there's a lot about normal life uh, that I really miss. Um, and it's, it's just really busy. The advice that I try to follow 
myself and that I share with others uh, is that it's important to get to know yourself. Uh, just as much as we cybersecurity practitioners obsess over the latest breach and how it happened, uh, the latest zero day exploit and how it worked, I actually think it's equally as important, maybe more important, to pay attention to how each of us feel and for us to manage our en energy accordingly. So there is a wealth of knowledge about how to manage one's time. So much content about time management. What I like to advocate for is actually energy management. There's only 24 hours in a day, but depending on my energy level, I can either feel totally depleted and like I have nothing left to give, or I can feel inspired, like my tank is full and like I can accomplish anything. My recommendation to you is to find out what activities give you energy and what takes it away from you and to choose your activities accordingly. Depending on how much time I have to give this talk, um, I like to go through a few things that I do to take care of myself to try and create energy in my life. Carol, um, Carol. Yes, John. You have no concerns about time. You just go. You're the last speaker. Okay, so cool, just, cool. You, as long as you're adding value, I won't kick you <laughs> off. So just okay. keep going. Phenomenal, phenomenal. Thank you so much, John. I appreciate it. And, you know, this next part, it's kind of like choose your own adventure. So at this point, if folks have questions, I would love to respond to questions. If folks want to know what kinds of things I do to take care of myself, I would love to share about that. Um, and then finally, if folks are interested, I also have a prepared guided meditation uh, that I can lead folks through. So uh, perhaps if I was a little bit more proactive about planning this session, I could have done some sort of fancy poll thing. Um, but that being said, I don't know actually if when I'm presenting, I can see if there's any Q&A. Um, if there is q and I would, I would love to chat with people about what questions they have. Uh, if not, I'm happy to go into uh, the other two pieces of content that I have prepared. Um, we don't have anything in Q&A right now. Anybody have any questions? Please please uh, add them to Q&A. We'd like to have a discussion here and make this interactive. Cool. Why don't in you the meantime, things, Caroline? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in the meantime, um, there is some there are some ideas that I'd love to share with folks about, you know, I had an opportunity to give this talk at B-sides and someone said to me, you know, when I think about my identity, so much of what I do is wrapped up in my work. And so it kind of feels like all I'm doing all day is cybersecurity. And sometimes I love it and sometimes it's not great, you know, but how do you kind of carve out time for stuff? And I said, you know, there are all these ways in which we can define ourselves. You know, when I choose which shirt to wear, and which color to wear and which shoes to wear, you know, what I choose to do in five minutes between meetings, whether it's doodling, um, there, there are these ways. So a couple ways that I, so there's these three categories that I want to talk about, mind, body, and spirit. Um, and here are simply a few things that have worked for me. So when it comes to the mind, um, over the past several years, I've tried experimenting with meditation. Sometimes I'll get into a place admittedly where I press play on my meditation app and then I promptly, you know, sort of decide to ignore it while I go do something else. That's not, that's not the way that works the best for me. Um, but today, one of the nice things about things like meditation apps is there's actually meditations as short as one minute or three minutes long. And so that kind of thing, you know, I think we can all find one or three minutes in a day. Um, journaling is one of those things that for me, it's easier said than done. It falls into this category of when would I possibly find time in a day to write for no particular productive reason? There's all sorts of writing that I need to do for you know important work reasons. Why would I, why would I just write to myself about myself. 
Um, and actually that, that ties a bit into the next category, which is therapy. Um, after this session, actually, uh, in about 50 minutes, I'll be speaking with my therapist, uh, a, an incredible person uh, that I've gotten to know over the past eight or so years. Um, to me, there's something magical about talking with someone for 50 minutes a week, just about you. It's someone who doesn't even really know you. You know, they don't play an active role in your life. They're not your spouse. You know, they're not your friend. Uh, they have no agenda, really. Um, and that for me has, has helped a lot. Um, I'm also not ashamed to say that when I need it, I'll take advantage of medication. This morning I took 40 milligrams of Prozac. And for me, that helps. I also, especially as a relatively new mom, uh, for me, and then I also spent the last, you know, more than three decades of my life in California, which is on fire. There's a lot to be said for insurance and the peace of mind that that brings for me. Um, for me, as a mom with kids, life insurance is super important. Um, I think it's extraordinarily important for us to take vacation. It's so easy for us as cybersecurity professionals to just work and work and work. Um, and I think that when we take vacation, when we step away from our computers, when we get to take a break, we can actually bring so much back with us when we return you know, to the office. Um, and I also think there's something to be said about art. My daughter's five years old now. I do a lot of art and craft projects with her um, and it's actually fun. I have found that it, it can be fun for no reason other than for fun. When it comes, so another thing is that, you know, we as humans, uh, we are, our destiny is constrained by our biology. There are ways to take care of our bodies and to enhance, you know, what they're capable of doing. Um, I find that when I get enough sleep, I feel better. I have more energy. I find that when I eat certain foods, I feel better. And when I eat certain foods, I feel worse. Um, as a person who spent pretty much all of my 20s living in San Francisco and living off of you know, eating out with friends and ordering takeout from restaurants. Um, it's been a pleasure for me to discover that cooking actually gives me a great deal of joy. Um, exercise is important if and when you can make it happen. Um, and I have this sort of generic uh, word here, which says care. Uh, and it's really silly, but what I mean by it is actually in my case. So maybe this is TMI. Maybe it's not, but um, I have dust and pollen allergies. Uh, and it took me years to figure out if I just take my daily medication for dust and pollen allergies, I actually feel way better. Um, so things like that, things like I have flat feet and while they may not be the most attractive, if I wear my orthopedic shoes, it actually feels better. So I just wear the expensive orthopedic shoes. <laughs> Um, I do think that there's something about taking care of what I hear use the term spirit. I've worked in organizations where I don't feel safe. I don't feel comfortable. Um, and when I work in an organization where I'm surrounded by people that I respect and like, that I feel respect and like me, that makes my spirit feel good. There are all sorts of jobs in cybersecurity, you know, and, and some of us, you know, we can choose to have different levels of impact. And I used to work for a video game company. And for me to have my life's work, to have what I do for eight plus hours every weekday, be securing Farmville, you know, that to me at the end of the day was just like not enough, you know? Um, but I think that in cybersecurity, we actually have tremendous opportunities to do very impactful work and that can be really good for our spirit. I think it's super important for us to spend time with our family, with our friends, with our pets, and not just be with our coworkers all the time, even if our coworkers are super awesome. 
Um, sometimes our colleagues, they are part of our tribes. You know, we as humans, you know, for thousands of years depended on each other for survival. And we, we have that in us, you know, we have that in the ways that our brains work. Um, so being with people that treat you well, that's a good thing. I also am a very anxious person and I've been working on that. And in these days there, it feels like there's a lot to be anxious about. I think there's always a lot to be anxious about. Um, one of the tips that my therapist shared with me that I, that I try to use sometimes is this idea that maybe despite how good we think we are at multitasking, maybe our minds can actually only focus on one thing at a time. And if I choose to think about something I'm grateful for, maybe there actually is less room for me to think about what I'm scared of or to think about what I'm anxious and worried about. Um, and things like rituals. You know, I think that a year like this one is one that has helped me to really question why I do the things that I do. And it's given me a chance and some space to decide what I want to do. Um, until this year, I was never actually able to do things like put my phone down an hour before I went and tried to sleep. Uh, and now I do. And I light a candle and I have some, uh, I have some nice essential oils that I like to smell. Um, so these are, these are some things, you know, I actually, uh, a decade or so ago had a pretty severe burnout problem. I had, uh, somewhat of a mental breakdown. And so, these are just a few ideas that I've cultivated really over the last decade of my life. Um, and with that, maybe for folks that are still with us, um, if you want to close your eyes and indulge me, uh, we can do a short guided meditation to end the session. So I'll invite you, if you want to, to close your eyes relax into a position that's comfortable for you and to begin focusing your attention on your breath. Imagine that every time you breathe out, you settle deeper into your position and everything slows down. See if you can breathe. I'm meditating. <laughs> We're meditating. See, I'm, I'm, see. I'm sorry. I'm trying to join you, join you here. Cool, cool, very good, yeah. See if you can breathe in just a little longer, breathe out just a little longer. This is a practice of being, of sitting with yourself in the present moment. There's nothing in this moment that you need to do. There's nothing to seek out, there's nothing to try. You can just kind of chill in this moment and just breathe. Maybe your mind is trying to problem solve. We are always trying to problem solve. Maybe you're trying to make the meditation work. Maybe you long to feel connected. And if you notice these types of thoughts, these types of emotions coming up, just notice them and let them go like clouds moving across the sky. Bring yourself back to your breath. Breathe in and breathe out. I believe that within each of us, within a matter of minutes, it is possible for us to stop and take a breath and engage and connect with the infinity that is in each of us. There is a space that exists within each of us where we can release our thoughts and emotions and just be and just listen for a moment. And sometimes when I'm able to do this, if there's guidance I'm looking for, if there are decisions that I'm thinking about, if there are emotions that I'm managing, I like to imagine releasing those things every time I breathe out. And just allowing myself to be here right now with no agenda, with no expectations, 
with no attachment, with no desires. Just a moment of presence. There's this idea that I like and that I want us to consider in this moment that everything you could possibly want might already be here, might already be in you. And all you might have to do is just listen. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you so much for indulging me, John. Thank you so much for asking me to join you today. It has been my true pleasure oh, thank uh, you. to thank be you. with you. This has been great. I, I really appreciate you joining us. We had some nice, uh, some nice comments uh, in the in the Q and A and in the chat. Um, we don't have any questions, so let me just wrap up here, and and thank everybody for attending. This is this is the end of day one of CornCon. I can't believe it went so fast. This has been great. We've had like 20 speakers today, and. Uh, um, I, I have some reminders. We do have a co we have contests going on. Uh, Insight Games has a tournament, and you can go join. There's contest information on our website and in Discord. And if you join the Insight card game, a security card game, it's really fun. They're having a tournament, giving away a Nintendo Switch tomorrow at 4:15, uh, right before Hacker Jeopardy. And we have a CTF that starts tonight at 8 p.m and we'll run tomorrow, and we'll also be giving prizes away uh, at 4.15 tomorrow afternoon. So uh, Discord will be open uh, for the next day until we conclude the conference. So go use Discord for conversations, uh, chat about the things you learned, and uh, chat with maybe some of the speakers will show up. I just wanna thank you, Caroline. This was, a, a, this was excellent. I meditated with you at the end. I didn't realize my microphone was off. I'm sorry about that. But, uh, um, your, your house is beautiful. I, I love your background <laughs> there. It's great, this, isn't it? You know, this, for this kicks, is, let me just show you my real house because I, I think like there's something to be said about, you know, real life here. <laughs> that's, um, that's transparency. <laughs> yep, yep. We, we, uh, that looked like Chensi Wang's house. <laughs> <laughs> she has a very beautiful house. Um, but I, I want to thank you again. And I want to thank everybody for showing up. Uh, we have, we have a ch uh, question here in chat, a comment in chat. What's the link for the CTF? Okay, so if you want to go to the CTF, if you go to our corncon.net uh, on our website, we do have the information to the contest there. Uh, you can also go to our Discord. The, the link to our Discord is on corncon.net as well. Um, and then we have something in Q&A here. Corncon rocks. Talk about the merchandise. We've got some really awesome merchandise at Teespring, and that's also on corncon.net. You can go order a T-shirt. We're going to be giving free free gear to all our speakers, so you'll get you get to pick something really cool with one of our CornCon logos, Caroline. But uh, thank you all, and this is the conclusion of day one, and I really appreciate everybody participating, and hope to see you all back at uh, 8:30 tomorrow morning Central Time. Thanks. <laughs>